Thank you very much for coming and, and thank you very much, Shari, for having me. Um, yes, I'm a children's author, um, also a publisher. I've published all of my books um, and I've learnt an awful lot about uh, obviously publishing books, but I've also, because I spend a lot of my time in schools and because I run a regular writing competition on my blog, I'm, I'm absolutely passionate about children's literacy. And I'm very worried of what's happening with children's literacy, as I think we probably all are. And so I want to talk about it today, but before I do, I'd, I'd quite like to know why you're here <laughs> and, and what you hope to get out of this particular talk, because I don't want to be going over stuff you already know, yeah? And I also want it to be a bit of a dialogue as well. So, you know, if you've got something to say about what I'm saying or if you've got your own suggestions, please <coughs> speak up and we can all benefit from each other's experience because I know I've got a lot of academics here so of course I'm feeling terribly nervous because I'm not an academic. I do have a law degree <laughs> and I did practice as a lawyer for a long time, but I have never lectured in academe. So, um, you know, you, please get involved. Okay, um, I, was, I was just wondering, I mean, are you here because of your own kids or because you are teaching kids or you're teaching older students or why is it that you're particularly interested in this talk? Does anyone want to, sorry? <laughs> I may be preaching to the converted with you. <laughs> I do this talk a lot in schools and I do it for parents and one of the things that really upsets me is I'm always preaching to the converted. Because if a parent doesn't care that their child is illiterate, they're not going to come along. And what I feel like doing is setting up camp outside the gate of the school <laughs> and just dragging them all in with a fishing net and say, you've really got to understand what a lack of literacy is going to do for your child in the future and what kind of a society we are building with children who are increasingly becoming less and less literate. And we all know what the bogeymen are. And I'll be talking quite a bit about the bogeymen as we go through the talk. Okay, hang on, what have we got? Ah, I'm just going to use this little arrow forward. These are my books. <laughs> the only one for sale outside is the tale of Rodney Ram and you better be quick because there's only two copies. <laughs> but you've all got bookmarks and I just wanted to let you know when you tried to get all my books, I've got a very good deal if you get the whole set on my online website which is on your bookmark. Okay, so first the bad news. I go into schools and I give my talk about how to write a riveting story. It's a workshop. And in this workshop I say to these little kids, and they are anything between 8 and 12 years old. I'll say to them, righto, now we're going to look at genre and we're going to look, say, at adventure. Why don't you describe for me, I say now in adventures, we're involving a physical challenge. Can someone give me a description of a main character? This is going to be the good guy or the good girl. Can you give me a description using adjectives? And the kids say, like Spider-Man. And I'll say, like Spider-Man? And they say, yeah, like Spider-Man. And then I say to them, well, we're not going to have any characters from popular fiction here. I want you to create someone for yourself. Give me some adjectives. They absolutely look at me blankly. They don't know what to say. Now, this is becoming a more and more common phenomenon. Kids are becoming less articulate every day. There's a particular school that I go to which is so keen on books and I love this school. They actually have book balconies right around the school and the headmistress really believes in music and books. So if you've got a sportsman on your hands, you don't send them to this particular school. Now at this school I talk to the grade fives and I give them my lecture and the teacher came up to me this year because I go in every year to do the grade fives and they said, you know, what you're saying, because I gave this talk to the teachers, is exactly right, this is what we're seeing and this is what we are seeing, an epidemic of right throughout English language schools. And I'm not just talking about here in Hong Kong, I'm talking about in Australia, I'm ashamed to say, where literacy is appalling at the moment, and this is happening in the States and the UK as well. And this is basically kids with poor vocabulary, unable to construct a sentence properly, non-existent grammar, little story structure, few original ideas, poor general knowledge. And this is the real crunch. I've gone into extremely posh schools in Melbourne where money is no object and the librarian will proudly show me the books that the children are producing. And I look at these books and digitally they're superb. 
I mean, they've got the bells and whistles. They look absolutely fantastic. They look highly professional. And then I start reading the story and it's embarrassing. And I don't know what to say to the librarian because the kids cannot write. So this is a problem. And this, obviously. And is this the experience that you are finding in your schools or with your teaching or with the kids you come into contact with this kind of a problem? Now, when I was a kid, we had hobbies. I'm an old lady. <laughs> and I can remember the first television we got. And it was tiny, it was black and white. And it only had programming from about 4 until 8 p.m. And it had, at that time, two channels. <laughs> and we were allowed to watch for half an hour. But what we spent our time doing, obviously, we were playing outside, we were building things inside if it rained, we had hobbies, that word that some kids don't even know the meaning of these days, and in particular, we read, and we read, and we read copiously, because that's what you did when it rained. <coughs> this particularly for boys. Now, all of these things, of course, the kids think they're playing, but what they're doing is their imaginations are working overtime, and they're also observing great knowledge. Stamp collecting in particular, my gosh, I have met one child in Hong Kong who collects stamps. And I went to see him, and he could tell me about every country in the world. He was phenomenal. But he is the class geek. That's how he's regarded. Now, when I was a kid, everybody collected stamps. This one is fascinating. Two years ago, Mattel posted its biggest loss ever. And they're the producers of Barbie dolls. And you're like, Barbie dolls? That is absolutely, that was sort of fundamental for girls. Everyone had a Barbie doll and dressed their Barbies and played with their dolls. They've lost those little kids to digital games. I love that picture of the guy bumping into the pole because of course that's what happens regularly. <laughs> Every day I watch kids Adults walking on the street and saying, oops, they're going to hit that there. But this is where the real crime begins. Here. Now, very serendipitously, my husband, who's French, pointed out to me an article in the Figaro just yesterday. And this is absolutely phenomenal, but it's not a unique occurrence. These are basically kindergarten psychologists and teachers who are reporting babies who have less than 10 words in their vocabulary, who cannot speak. They talk in particular in this article about a little girl whose parents were terribly proud of her because at the age of three she's starting school and she can speak some words of English. And this is because she's been playing digital games since she's been 18 months old. That's when she got her first laptop. But as soon as this little child hit school where there were no tablets, she couldn't relate to anybody she didn't respond to her own name. She couldn't stack blocks. And in particular, she couldn't play without a teacher sitting beside her using, manipulating her limbs to follow what the other kids were doing. This child was almost unresponsive. And it's a very interesting article because basically, and you'll be getting, I've, I've got a handout for everyone to take home and read, which will have my top tips on it, but also have the references for all of the literature I'll be referring to. But what's happening is that there seems to be this explosion of autism in the population. And yet for a lot of kids that are diagnosed as autistic, you take their screens away and within months they're normal. So it's not autism. In, and of course, ADHD. Children unable to focus for any length of time. So this is pretty scary. But then on the other hand, back in 2014, it was being reported by teachers in the UK, infants unable to stack building blocks. It's really scary. And if you look at this article, basically there was an increase from one in 33 children to one in five over the last 12 years who are reporting major developmental delays. And here's the American Association of Paediatrics. It's fascinating, you know. I look for the Australian Association of Paediatrics, and I look for the UK Association of Paediatrics, and they're not coming out and just putting it bluntly what we ought to be doing. The American Association is terrific. And they're saying, basically, 
one or two hours a day of high quality content full stop and yet the average kid seven hours a day. So I just don't know why we're doing it and why we're doing it to our kids. But I think it's basically, first of all, it's the great sort of um, pacifier. It's very easy to give a kid a screen and have them hooked on the screen and the kid will be quiet and the kid won't be outside at fear of the roaming pedophile. <laughs> there are no more pedophiles today than there ever were. But the fact is, there's no more kids on the streets. So if you're the parent who decides to use some common sense and get their kids playing outside and using the streets, I guess that kid's at more risk. <laughs> but we all grew up playing outside. And these kids are basically in their rooms. Now, we heard of the horrible batch of suicides recently here in Hong Kong from these kids who just felt so alone and so isolated. And I know that at least one of those suicides was associated with a row over basically the boy would not stop using his digital screen. So, it doesn't have to be this way. This is a child and she's one of a few, I've got a clutch of kids who are regular winners in my writing competition. They're there every time and my God, they can write. And I'd love you to have a look actually at my writing competitions. It's on my blog. So if you go, it's just Sarah Brennan blog. I've just announced the results of the latest one, but it's very interesting. Basically, you get these kids who can write their heads off and they have beautiful literacy skills. They have the power of imagination. They have lyrical language. A lot of these kids from the Indian subcontinent, which is really interesting. Also, we've got some fabulous Chinese kids who are doing this from Shanghai and from Hong Kong. And we've got a few kids coming up from Australia, America and the UK. So the kids are there, but these kids now are the exception rather than the rule, the kids that can literally write beautifully. This little girl, Gemma Julian, I always talk about because the first time she entered one of my competitions, her writing was so good, I didn't believe she'd done it. So I wrote and said, well, what school does she go to? Well, actually, she's home educated, which is interesting. So I write to the mum and I say, can you verify for me that this is your child's own work? And she wrote back and said, she said, do you want to see the rest? And this is what this girl's doing. And this was when she was eight. <laughs> and, you know, she's got, you know, the bees flirting with the daffodils. I mean, what child thinks of bees flirting with the daffodils? But this child has a beautiful, creative brain. Now, I've made a friend of Gemma because when I go to Sydney, I meet up with her and her mum, and I asked this child, how much time do you actually spend on screens? And she said, a little bit, but she said, I find it a bit boring. She's got pen pals, but she actually writes them by hand. She's got pen pals all over the place. And she does a lot of drawing and writing, and so she'll use the internet occasionally. But she doesn't do social media because she thinks it's stupid, and to write is it stupid especially at that age, my gosh. So we all know that you have to read before you can learn. But why is it important to read books? And in particular, why is it important to read real books, as in print books, the sort of ones we can pick up and hold? Has anyone heard of this guy before? Yes. Now, this is absolutely essential reading for everybody who wants to join the fight against illiteracy. Read this guy. This book was shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize, and he is remarkable. You will have the references on a handout, which I think Shari might be getting, but you can give me your cards and I can send you my talk and, in particular, all of the referrals you can do. And that might be better because then you can just click on the links and you'll be right through. You won't have to type them all into computers. But this guy's fascinating. He's a real thinker. I think he's a bit of a seer. He doesn't just address children's literature. He addresses adult literacy. And he also addresses things like, for example, what the hell are we doing with our bathrooms when you can't manually turn on a tap anywhere anymore and where the bathroom is going to flush or the toilet's going to flush before you've even sat up off the seat. But this whole idea of basically how we are digitalizing our worlds to such an extent that when we have the next sun or the solar flare, and it's not a case of if, it's a case of when this solar flare is coming, it's going to knock out every computer on this planet, and then let's see if the human race can survive. And for that, this is not on my page, but you can write it down. Next time you're on a plane, you need to watch a documentary called Lo and Behold. It's by the German writer and philosopher Werner Herzog, and he is looking at the internet and what the hell is happening with the internet, and he is talking about the solar flare that occurred in the 19th century, about 1886. 
And at that time, every telegraph system in the world was knocked out. And it didn't affect too many people because not many people were using the telegraph. However, the next solar flare that happens, and we are overdue a major solar flare, it's going to knock out every single computer system here on Earth for quite some time. Now, the US government knows about this. They've got a bit of a sort of contingency plan, but nobody tells us about it. Just be careful you've got a tap that turns on of its own volition that is actually connected to a water supply that doesn't depend on electronic uh, devices to turn it on or off. Because we're going to have major problems with food supply, with everything, when this solar flare happens. We are getting too smart for our own good. However, that's not the subject of my talk today. This guy does address it. Go to, he's got a fabulous blog, and I know I'm going to try and remember the name of it. Um, oh, Rough Type, R-O-U-G-H-T-Y-P-E, because the guy's a thinker, and we need more of these thinkers today, because a lot of us, we're not thinking enough. Right. So, what he does in his book, and you know, when I found his book, I found it in Paris, actually, and I was just like, hallelujah, there is a God. Because for many years, I have been so upset about seeing kids addicted to screens, particularly little kids. I mean, even to the point that I go up and actually say to their parents, do you know what you're doing to your kid's brain? <laughs> I, have been, I have been told to mind my own business on more than one occasion. I get so distressed, though, when I see kids put in front of screens at dinner tables. But um, I found this book, and I thought, hallelujah, here's the science. And since then, I've been following the science. Because it's not just me being a Luddite. It's not just me not getting with the program. There is a major uh, neurological, neurophysical, developmental problem with kids being subjected to overuse of screens. And most kids are now overusing screens. So he talks about basically how our brains have been wired. And he talks about, first of all, we're wired for flight and fight because we have to shift attention to follow the deer or to avoid the saber-toothed tiger, and that ensured our survival. So we had fairly rudimentary wiring of the brain back then, and then we go through the oral tradition where the wiring changes immediately so that we can remember and we can repeat, and we become all rhythmic, and then the earliest writing. So again, we've suddenly got new neural pathways developing right through. To this fab chap. In the second century, Ceylon, who invented the first properly usable paper here in China. And this fantastic guy, Bi Sheng. Everyone talks about Gutenberg, and it wasn't Gutenberg at all who invented movable type printing, it was this guy here, and very little is known about him. They think he was just a, a peasant who was very clever. And so he started carving individual Chinese characters on blocks, and then he ordered them on a grid, depending on their meaning. And then, instead of having to do these massive, great carvings on an entire wooden block of an entire poster, so you had to carve every character, he just selected every block. And that way, he could shift it around, and it, was, it appeared to be a lot quicker. It never really took off in China, because there are thousands of pictograms, and no one can do all the pictograms. But when it hit the West, with a 26-letter alphabet, it took off. In the meantime, in the Middle Ages, you've got basically Knowledge was in the hands of a few. It was basically the church, and it was the nobility, and the power structure was unaltered, and the peasants didn't have a chance because the only people who were educated were the people at the top. Then the merchant class starts reading. This is fascinating. Apparently, there were no gaps and no punctuation. It must have been very hard to read, so they insisted on the gaps and the punctuation at the Middle Ages. And this is the big thing in Europe where suddenly you get this virtuous cycle, books are suddenly affordable and plentiful, and the common man starts reading. And it's absolutely no coincidence that it was the common man starting to read, and this is what it did to our brains. This one in particular, the ability to concentrate intently over a long period of time on a static object. It led to deep thought. Amongst ordinary people, that's you and me, and not just the people at the top of the hierarchy. And of course, that turned everything upside down. So you ended up, I love this quote. This is from Nicholas Carr. Deep concentration combined with a highly active and efficient deciphering of text and interpretation of meaning. And I love this, in the quiet spaces opened up by the prolonged, undistracted reading of a book, people start thinking deeply. 
And that's what we got. We got the Renaissance. This absolute explosion of ideas and thought and creativity. And the Reformation. The whole power structure was turned upside down. And the Age of Enlightenment, where suddenly the individual was important, and you know, radical ideas like democracy started spreading through the world. That's what books did, and that's what reading did. And I chose these books very deliberately. You've got Gibbon, who did the first ever proper history, Darwin. because when I did this I actually started having difficulty around about the 1990s. Where do I find the world changing book in the 1990s? And that's the one I found. <laughs> but the reason why of course because it, it was in the 1990s that everything changed and suddenly we all start getting onto the internet and then of course this one has been the phenomenon of the last five years. Do you know what that one is? Think about it. Fifty Shades of Grey. Isn't it an indictment of us as a human species that this is the publishing phenomenon of the last five years? I think every word of this quote from Nicholas Carr, when I read it, I said, yes, 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 this is what's going to happen. What's happening to our minds? So he goes into how the brain's wired, and you see, I always thought that our brains were pretty much, you know, they were pristine when we were born, but undeveloped, and then they got developed through our education, and then round about the age of 22, they started declining rapidly, and by the age of 90, we were dead meat. <laughs> and that apparently is not true. Apparently, as far as uh, neurologists are concerned, the brain keeps wiring all the time in response to the stimulus you put in front of it, all the time, right up to the time we die. The brain is changing, changing, changing. So what you do a lot, you get really good at. And what you don't do much, basically the brain's capacity to deal with that deteriorates and you can't do it very well. And that's, of course, why we do best what we practice the most. Has anyone read this guy, Malcolm Gladwell? He's fascinating. I love this guy. He's such an original thinker. He thinks outside the box. But this outliers book is fascinating because he's looking at the concept of genius. Does it really exist? And he says, no, it doesn't. He said, maybe Mozart was a genius. Maybe. But no one else is a genius at all. And having done studies, particularly on the kids that are absolutely fantastic at sport and the kids that are fantastic at music, he says, it's nothing to do with innate ability. It's everything to do with the amount of time they practice it. And he talks in particular about a German school where kids go in at the age of 12 and come out at the age of 16. And these kids are all regarded as prodigies when they go in. They're all absolutely brilliant at violin, piano or whatever. When they come out at 16, there's a marked difference between the kids. So what they did was study why are these kids different. Are they actually inherently more able? But no, they weren't. It wasn't that. It's just they put in more hours. So it's this concept of 10,000 hours. So if we look at what repeatedly reading books does for the brain, deep concentration, interpretation of meaning, imagination, making associations, drawing inferences, sort of developing new ideas. You can imagine what that does to a kid's brain. And if they can rack up 10,000 hours, you're going to have a kid with absolutely fabulous general knowledge, a kid who has, is, has fabulous vocabulary, and a kid who can think for themselves. I love this quote from Einstein, and he's absolutely right. Everyone talks about, you know, we don't need books anymore because we've got Google. We don't need libraries anymore because we've got Google. But that's just knowledge, and if knowledge were everything, then we wouldn't have the problems we have today. And what we need today, particularly with our kids, is kids who can think outside the box. Because we've got ideas that we certainly never expected to face. Terrible problems, I mean obviously global warming, global terrorism, and how about artificial intelligence? That's a doozy. I don't know if you've read the latest Vanity Fair, but my gosh, Elon Musk, good old Elon Musk, is taking on the AI industry 
because it is led at the moment by a guy in London who actually thinks it's okay to say that they are inventing artificial intelligence that will make humans irrelevant. And he thinks it's okay to say that. Why that guy isn't behind bars, I do not know. He talks about having gone to a meeting with this guy and out comes another guy who says, you know, I should shoot him right away because that will save the human race. Now these guys, these brilliant minds are actually working on making artificial intelligence to supplant us. It's horrifying and that's what our kids are facing. So what we want is kids. We want kids who are articulate, kids with ideas, kids who are thinkers, kids who are originals and kids who can challenge this new hierarchy. We need kids who have minds. But what's happening to kids' minds at the moment? Now, I love this one because I say to kids when I go to schools, I do this talk for little kids, believe you me, and my gosh, do the kids, they, they, they catch on. It's the parents who are the problem. The kids get it. And I say to them, who read Harry Potter? And they all put up their hands. And I say, right, when you read Harry Potter, was he naked? And there's this little titter, eep, like this. And I say, no, no, seriously, was he naked? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, does J.K. Rowling tell you what he was wearing every day? And they're like, no. And I say, well, who put on the clothes? And the fascinating thing, of course, is this process of what's called sensory simulation as you read. And there have been some fabulous experiments done recently on adults. And what they do is they wire them up all over the brain. And then they get them to read a story about a man who's climbing a mountain and he slips and he falls and he slips and he falls and he gets to the top and then he falls off altogether. And what they're finding is that the brain is lighting up in the reader in exactly the same place it would be lighting up if they were that person climbing the mountain. That's what happens when we read and we don't know it. We are imagining ourselves in that role in every particular. We are seeing it, we are hearing it, and even more importantly, we are feeling it. Now imagine what that does if you're doing that for 10,000 years, imagining what it's like to be somebody else. There's a lot of studies which I'll show you later on empathy. People who read particularly fiction are far more likely to adopt a child, to give to charity, to work for an NGO, for basically to do things for other people than people who do not read lots of fiction. There are wonderful studies on this. There was a study done two years ago in the United States that had been done 10 years earlier at a university in these 19 year olds and they all came from similar socioeconomic backgrounds but they were wired up and they were shown distressing images and 12 years ago these kids their brains flashed up all over the place they were distressed by the images and then two years ago they ran exactly the same experiment with 19 year olds entering university and they showed them the same images and there was barely a response in their brains. And what the researchers concluded, not me, but the researchers concluded, that the only difference between these two cohorts was that one cohort was used to reading books and read copiously, and the other cohort had stopped reading books. That was the difference. So we've got to kind of ask ourselves what kind of society we want. This is fascinating. This is another book that I would urge you to read, particularly if you're a parent, this Read Aloud Handbook. This one went into about 10 editions before the poor guy died just fairly recently. Wonderful man. But he talks about the fact that even in children's storybooks, there are double the number of rare words than in adult conversation. Ah, we've got the handouts. Great. So you can get these afterwards. But, yeah, absolutely. So I say to kids, you know, <laughs> say to mum and dad, sorry, I'm too busy to talk to you. I'm going to read a children's book because I'm going to get better language out of the children's book. But this is fascinating. In children's books, there's this rich, these rich words. Now, I am not panning the internet as a whole. It's a fabulous tool and I would certainly not have been able to build my business without the internet and nor would most of us be able to function now with it as a tool for business. So as a tool it has many astounding benefits and obviously these are the four main ones. Your access to information, search and filtering tools, ease of access, more connections, more ideas, etc. I even put hearts on this just to prove I am not someone who hates the internet. I'm not. I need it. I need it every day. And yet Steve Jobs was a low-tech parent. He did not allow his children access to iPads and tablets. 
and indeed, it's interesting. In Silicon Valley, Valley, you've got these Steiner Waldorf schools where the kids aren't allowed access to screens at all in primary school. And it is packed with the kids of these techie founders. You know, these very experimental. They're right on the cutting edge of technology. So what do they know that they're not telling us? And here's some fabulous recent studies. Reduced IQ and short-term memory in workers distracted by multitasking and digital devices. I love this one, the Norwegian study. It's fascinating. It's actually been reported in, uh, repeated in America. If you give two people of apparently equal education and intelligence a book and you randomise them, one to the print book and one to Kindle, and then when they've read it, you test them on recall, it's something like a third less if you've read it on Kindle. Now, they think what it is, is it's something to do with pixels. And they think that, you know, pixels, while it's not picked up by your eye, it is picked up by your inner brain. So that is constant distraction and why you're not absorbing the information in the same way. I love this one, these kids, the American linguistics academic. He actually asked these students, uh, university students, be honest, how likely are you to be distracted if you're studying from hard copy? 1%. On screen, 90%. What's it doing to our brains? Now, you've got, you will have all the actual references, so don't worry about it. You'll be able to look it up for yourself and read it. So, if we look at what, if we are, if we repeatedly use the internet, cursory reading, hurry distracted thinking and superficial learning, and this is particularly true with little kids, and teachers will tell you time and again they are fighting all the time, cut and paste. And I don't know, when, when I was little and I was given an assignment on elephants, I used to go to the library and pull out every single book because that was my only source of information. And then I'd have to read those books to get the information about elephants I needed. But because I couldn't photocopy it, I had to think for myself, what information am I selecting? And I'd write it down. And then I'd end up with pages of information all handwritten down about elephants that I'd selected. And then from that, I would have to select what am I going to put in my project. Whereas today what the kids do is they go to the first page of Google only, very lucky to even get to the second page. They'll never get that rare nugget about elephants that's on page 20 of Google. So they go to the first page, they all look at the same articles, they cut and paste from them, and then the primary skill is how do I manipulate this information so it doesn't look plagiarised. That's the primary skill that they're learning. They're not learning about elephants. And at the end of the day, they know very little about elephants. They remember very little about elephants. What they do know is how to manipulate a mouse, they know how to cut and paste, and they know how to basically change the words up so it doesn't look plagiarised. Now, we all know, <laughs> I don't know about you, I'm making a point now. Once a month, I learn a new phone number. I'm doing it on purpose because <laughs> I discovered to my shock and horror, you know, I was thinking about it and I thought, well, crikey, how many phone numbers do I know off by heart? I knew about five and that was it. This is terrible. We all used to have phone numbers just right through our heads. So, of course, we are outsourcing our memories. And that's all very well. But what is that actually doing to our brains? Because if we're not practicing memory, then we're not going to be good at memorising other things. And then also, what happens when you lose your mobile phone and your computer goes on the blink or, God forbid, there is a sun flare? We're not going to be able to phone our mums. <laughs> so it's pretty scary. We need to use our brains and we need to keep our memories sharp. This business here, the automated information sorters, of course with Google or with any of the other search engines, as we all know, they will put on the first page the pages that are searched the most. So everybody starts thinking exactly the same, that's if they're thinking at all. Their information all comes off page one of this information sorter and they're not going to be thinking outside the box and this empathy and compassion business. The other thing with empathy and compassion apparently is that these are called higher emotions. And what has to happen is that it develops over a long period of time with a slow drip drip into the inner brain. Now you don't get slow drip drip into the inner brain if the brain is being constantly distracted on a more shallow level. So I think we're going backwards. <laughs> I really do. I think our brains are going backwards to brains that have very little capacity to remember to brains that are distracted all the time, and particularly for children. I mean, the problem is you, we all grew up in the linear age, so we all have an experience and a knowledge of what it's like to live without these tools. But children think that this is the way humans are. And they will always choose digital. They'll go for digital because it's mighty attractive, and particularly digital games. And the horrific thing, obviously, about digital games 
is that the makers of digital games make them addictive by manipulating the pixels. They know exactly how fast they've got to get these pixels moving to actually switch off the critical elements in the brain and to switch on or to make those games addictive. It is so cynical, it is unbelievable. So what's going to happen to our singular intelligences? I'm lucky to have a most wonderful husband, <laughs> and he's a Frenchman, and he has been reading all his life, and he, I kind of like my, you know, some of my BBC Two sewing programs and cooking programs and things like that, he never watches them. He sits there and reads every single night, and I've learnt to keep him company most nights, and boy has it done a lot of good to me, it's been fabulous. But I have to say that Philippe, we actually wouldn't need Google in our house because his knowledge of the world and of politics and of particularly history and how history has affected politics is profound. Now the reason why he's not particularly gifted, it's just a man who has read all his life. And what we do now for Christmas, which is rather fabulous and I'd encourage you all to do it, is instead of getting the, the piece of jewellery or the piece of tech, spend that same money on books. Because we do that now, and you end up with your reading for the year, and that way you can explore themes. And I now know so much more about fin de siècle Austria. I knew nothing about the First World War and the causes of the First World War. And then I start reading because my darling Philippe starts really getting interesting books out there for me. And now I know quite a lot and can tell you quite a lot. And that's only happened in the space of a couple of years. But the beauty of reading and reading in depth is that you can start getting to the real nuggets of books, the gems of books, and you start building this idiosyncratic intelligence because no one else has read the same books as you. So you end up with a spider web of intense knowledge about a particular subject. This is what I want kids to develop. I did this talk at Australian International School two days ago, and I can tell you the kids aren't going, oh no, give him a digital games. They are listening intently. And I had kids coming straight back afterwards, a little girl saying, how much per day do you think I should spend on social media? And I said, well, what do you think social media is doing for your brain? Particularly at that age, OMG, as they say. She's like, uh, like this. And I'm like, right, well, you're going to get very good at what you do the most. So I reckon I would limit it to half an hour. And then I would say to your friends, sorry, got to go off and read a book. And make that trendy, make that cool. Get all the kids onto reading books. The kids get it. It's the mums and dads out there who aren't getting it. And I think it's because it's kind of easy to think and it's desirable to think that you are being a good parent, keeping your child up to date with digital. Yeah? This is why I think even babies are given digital. I was at Kinakanya Bookshop in Sydney two years ago and I was talking to the bookseller there and he said he had had a parent in the day before who wanted a book about digital programming for a five-year-old. Now that's astounding. Schools think that's important. I say there should be no screens in primary school. The more I read about this, the more I think we should get screens out of primary school. And I'll, I'll give you some research later on, the latest OECD report that came out last year. And what that report said, that there is simply no benefit whatsoever that has been found over studying it now for at least a decade there is no benefit to educating children on screens. None at all. In fact, the reverse. The results are going down. Now, there are always individual kids with certain neurological difficulties who can process material better off a screen. And I say give them a screen. But that's the exception rather than rule, and you do it on a medical report. But for everybody else out there, we have to teach our kids the primary ability to think to focus on a static object, to read, and to de start developing all this rich language and this, this ability to process ideas, to make con connections, all those things you get through reading. We must do that. We've got to turn it back. So, my top 10 tips. <laughs> First, check your child's eyesight because some kids are reluctant readers because they just can't see the page. Okay, you've got to give your child the gift of time. This is such a huge one these days, particularly here in Hong Kong and also in Shanghai. I did this talk at Shatin Junior the other day, and it was, it's, I shall tell you a secret, okay, that's got a very enlightened head teacher. His name is Perry Tunisi. I adore Perry. Perry has just made homework at school entirely optional. 
He says that there is no benefit that has been found on papers on kids doing homework over the years that shows there's a benefit to kids that age having to do homework after school. They should be outside playing, they should be reading, and they should be having fun and socially interacting. And that is better for them as students. And you know who he's had problems from? The parents. Up in arms, absolutely up in arms. We want our children to have homework and he has them all in individually and talks them all individually. This is why we're doing it. It's actually an academic benefit to your child not to be doing the homework. So what a lot of these parents have done is because their child now has acres of time and God forbid a child should have time on their hands, they've stacked them up with extracurricular activities and learning. So I spoke to these grade fives and I asked them how many extracurricular activities do you do? Who does two? One child put up his hand. I said, congratulations, that's reasonable. Who does three? More hands. The median number was five extracurricular activities. And these kids are expected to basically be able to breathe. It's awful. And then I had one dear little girl came up to me afterwards, wringing her hands, and she said, you've got to talk to my parents. And I said, what's going on? Well, it's just that they think that weekends are for music school, and they think that the week is for work, and then I'm doing Kumon, and I'm doing this, that, and the other. This beautiful, intelligent little girl was being crushed. And I said, well, what would you do if you had time? Read. That's what she wants to do, read. And this little darling child, and I said, but you can't be good at, you know, I mean, and I say to kids, talk to mum and dad and say to them, I want to do only two or maybe one. Choose your favourites. Only do those favourite activities because if they're favourites, you'll do them well and you'll enjoy them and that's what it's all about. But you're not going to, if you are studying Mandarin, if you're studying advanced maths, if you're studying, I don't know, French, if you're studying acrobatics, if you're studying ballet, you're not going to become world class at all those things. You don't need them. And you absolutely don't need that kind of a childhood, which is no childhood at all. What you need is time. Time to build things out of cornflakes packets. Time to get bored. Boredom is terribly important. Okay, I've been told I've got five minutes left. Are you ready? It's all on the list anyway, but we're going to shoot through this. How to create time, reorder priorities, be realistic about their abilities. Only choose one or two activities and the rest of the time give them time to breathe. Never force your child to read. What you do is you brainwash. There is a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry, digital industry out there, absolutely set on brainwashing not just your kids but you, so you have to brainwash back. This is what you say to the kids. We are a family that read books. Okay, now, this is really fascinating. This is an absolute top tip. There are two absolute top tips. This is one of them. You have to read in front of your children and read for pleasure, not just on holidays on the beach. You have to do it every night. You get out your book and you read and you comment and you talk about it at the table and actually you have dinner at the table all together, yeah? And talk. So, if you don't read books for pleasure yourself, you can talk till you're blue in the face to your child that they should be doing it, but they're going to be watching what you do. And if what you do, as, as, as a lot of us attempted to do, and I'm no exception, I can be on my wretched screen in the evening. If you're on your screen, kids will think, that's what you do as a grown-up. I love that picture. Beautiful. That's what life used to be like, and we can recreate it. Boys do what dads do. If you've got a son who's a reluctant reader, and many boys are the major problem with, with reluctant reading, Dad, if he's away on business a lot and he comes back, he has to decide, is it kicking a football or is it reading with my child? What is more important? Because if the dad reads with the child, the child thinks, ah, that's what's important. Make over your home. It was very hard for me to find that photo. And in fact, you go into a lot of homes these days and the bookshelves are filled with photographs and medals and objet d'art, but they're not filled with books. Take your TV off centre stage, so it's not the first thing your kid sees, it's all visual cues. The first thing your kid sees has to be books, not the television. A kid's bedroom must have bookshelves. And this is a lovely idea. You can get these online, that's a good use of online. Get them an ex libris stamp, very exciting. Get them a library membership card. Get them a bedside light. This is probably the, the, most efficient way of creating a great reader, and that is reading aloud to your child. And you can do that right up until their teens. 
You can if you get the right material, because actually what kids want is they want you. <laughs> All kids want mum and dad. And they want your love and your attention. So if what your love and your attention for them is associated with is every day we curl up with a book, then there'll be a Pavlovian effect. And they will believe forever after they'll feel warm, fuzzy and full of love when they see a book. That's how you make them love books, associated with your time and your attention. So, it most of all improves their attitudes to reading, but it's fascinating. If you read to a child from the time it's born, then by the time it hits school, it's two years ahead of its peers, and that persists right up to university, two years ahead. Because it builds vocab, comprehension, general knowledge, demonstrates you think books are important, builds their attention span, and it associates reading with pleasure. Fabulous experiment. This you will find in Jim Trelease's book. But all this headmaster did in a failing school was to improve the lighting and then to have the teachers do 10 minutes reading aloud at the beginning of the day, 10 minutes sustained silent reading, and he turned the school around in just four years. And that same experiment has been done in Japan with great effect. And you make it special. And above all, when you're reading to your child, you turn off your digital devices and you close the door so that they get the message, books are more important than digital screens. Family outings, we're blessed here in Hong Kong. That's me with one of my book launches. But we are blessed with many, many book launches. You've just got to get on the mailing list of people like Bookazine, and you can get your kid to book launches, and you can go to them. Go to the festivals, fabulous. And then when you go home, you rave to your children about meeting the authors and about the books. You're just conditioning their brain. We're the family that revolves around books. Books for birthdays, what happened to that? And you get the kids to choose the books. Finding the hook. There are some kids that no matter what you seem to do, they're still not interested in reading. This is where your librarians come in handy and your teachers, because there are, you know, the children's uh, book selection now is greater than it's ever been. So if you've got a kid who's really hooked into things like, I don't know, soccer or, I don't know, grooming horses or racing cars or, or even, even, if they're totally hooked into their digital games. Get books about kids who got involved in a digital game. You know, you can do it that way, just find the subject that turns them on. And if all else fails, the Guinness Book of Records always, always succeeds. Take an interest in what your child's reading. Rank bribery and corruption. I'm all into blackmail and rank bribery and corruption. You give them a bedside lamp and you give them a later bedtime if they're reading a book, but the one thing you do is get digital out of their bedrooms. It's hard in Hong Kong, we have such tiny houses. It's really difficult. But you've got to do it. You can't have them with digital in their rooms. And you can sneak it under the radar, especially with boys. It's a goodie. You've got to be really inventive and think out of left field to get them reading, 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 reading. That's a normal part of their lives. And this is huge. For some reason, parents seem to have this sort of idea that digital technology and the internet, etc., is sort of like sacrosanct and that they cannot say no to their child because somehow they're breaching some unwritten law. And it's not true. All parents have the right to say no. And I always say to mums and dads, OK, if a salesman comes to your door and he says, I have got a drink for your child, and this, child, this drink is going to inhibit their social development, inhibit their language development, it's going to inhibit their gross motor development, it's going to inhibit their fine motor development. It is going to bring them backwards so far that they are going to be literally when they get to school slightly catatonic, you would report that person to social services or to the police and they'd be locked up in jail. And yet parents are bringing in these screens right through the door thinking they're doing their children good. Computers are tools, not toys, get them off the digital games. You can follow my blog because my blog's the anti-digital blog. I have writing competitions, I have amazing books they can read, and they can read about their favourite authors. And this is the last thing. Who wants to be rich and famous? This is what studies in the United States that have followed kids who are readers for decades shows that basically, if you're a reader, that's what you can expect. I don't put up a slide for the other side, but that was fascinating. The kids who don't read at all are the ones more likely to be put in prison. <laughs> it's pretty awful. <laughs> and I love this one. For Abraham Lincoln, he grew up in a, a hut with dirt floor. 
And he said it was books that made him into what he was. And we mustn't forget that. So, and this is true. <laughs> so, that's it. Sorry, I know I'm probably talking to the converted and you've, all of you, know all of this anyway, but read the handouts and at the back you've got all of the stuff I've been digging up, but there is so much more. We've just got to be aware now. If you just put into Google or whatever, delayed development, digital screens, you come up with a plethora. So I just say, what the hell are we doing? And why isn't someone going to the government? And why isn't the government taking on the digital industry and saying no for children? Anyway. Thank you. <laughs>